We started Nature League one year ago to explore the amazingness of life on Earth. Since then, we've explored a ton of different topics, formats, and themes, and had a lot of fun along the way. To celebrate our first year of content, we'd like to share a compilation video from our first month, which explored the theme of life itself. It began with a lesson plan about how we define life here on Earth. We'll start at the very beginning and ask ourselves, what is life? Like, why is a rock different from a tiger? And what's the deal with saying carbon-based life forms? You might be able to come up with several answers to the first question. I mean, there are some pretty noticeable differences between rocks and tigers, right? But in order to have a working understanding of what life is, scientists had to get pretty precise. So let's get on their level and check out these properties and processes that define living things. Number one, order. Living things are structured on almost every level, whether you're looking at the cellular level or zooming out to look at total body structure. This hierarchical, leveled nature of living things is what allows them to exist in such amazing forms. Number two, evolutionary adaptation. Living things change over time in ways that are adapted to the environment. Evolution is the mechanism that does it all. How incredible is change when you really think about it? Number three, response to the environment. It's one thing to exist, and another thing to exist in response to your surroundings. It's a sort of deep concept, but the fact that a living thing makes changes to itself in response to something else is unique to life. Number four, regulation. Goldilocks got it right. There really is that sweet spot that's just right. Living things have the remarkable ability of making changes to themselves in order to reach or stay in that perfect window of conditions, or homeostasis. Number five, energy processing. Living things take in materials and use them to create other materials. It might sound simple, but processes like photosynthesis are actually mind-blowing when you really think about it. Number six, reproduction. Sex, am I right? Or not sex. Whether it entails getting it on or not, life finds a way to make more of itself, usually by means of passing on genetic material. Number seven, growth and development. Cells both divide and grow, meaning that living things get bigger over time. In addition to size, living things can develop into different forms throughout their lifespan. I mean, butterflies are caterpillars, so what about carbon? Some of my favorite science fiction arguments are concerned with defining extraterrestrial life forms, and whether we would recognize an alien as alive, even if it was made up of elements unlike any on our planet. This is a fun and friendly argument for a late night with friends, but life on Earth is inarguably made up of that amazing element carbon. And it's not just carbon on its own that's amazing, but rather carbon in combination with other elements. It's carbon's ability to bond with other elements that makes it the centerpiece of the macromolecules, or big pieces of life on Earth. The four major macromolecules of life on Earth are one, carbohydrates, two, lipids or fats, three, proteins, and four, nucleic acids like DNA and RNA. And carbon is in the middle of all of them. Now, the characteristics of life and carbon we've discussed here were taken from a single biology textbook. If you look around, you might find a few other characteristics, like living things are made of cells. It's totally fine if you learned a different group of life characteristics or additional roles of carbon. The point is, what makes life life is pretty amazing. When we started this channel, we knew we had to take advantage of the beautiful place where we film our content. Throughout the year, we've gone on several field trips, but our very first one started right in our backyard. What I wanted to do for this first field trip was kind of introduce myself and also introduce this place that we're going to be exploring together. I am from Florida. I did my bachelor's degree at the University of Florida in zoology, and I minored in wildlife ecology and conservation. I discovered conservation genetics, which is what I really fell in love with in terms of research. I went and did a master's in North Carolina at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, uh, and I did that degree in marine biology. After doing my master's, I realized that I wanted to tell the story of science to a bigger audience. So do it in a way that could incorporate some of the other things I love in life, which are performing and teaching. And so I decided to move out to Montana to do a degree in science and natural history filmmaking. Turns out filmmaking wasn't the perfect fit, at least not with that program, and I really missed science. And the nice thing is that there was an expert in conservation genetics uh, right here where we are now in Missoula, Montana. So I switched over and I am now doing a PhD in wildlife biology. So we are super lucky to be here filming this show in Missoula, Montana. And before I tell you about it, I think we should probably go on a little walk so you can see a little bit more of it. So where is Missoula? Well, we are on the northwest side of Montana. The elevation is close to 3,000 feet or uh, about 1,000 meters. 
and that sits us right here in the Rocky Mountains of the United States. So if you were here 13,000 years ago, you would see something totally different because Missoula and Missoula Valley actually used to be a glacial lake and you can still see signatures of the fact that it was underwater where the waves would lap against the shore that are all in stripes along the mountain sides or we call them striations. So there's still little hints of what this used to be like. There's evidence that there have been people here in Missoula Valley for over 12,000 years or so. Um, and then Lewis and Clark came through, they led expeditions. And so since the last couple of centuries, Missoula has grown like a lot of other places out in the West. So nowadays we have about 72,000 or so people in terms of our population, which depending on where you live might be big or small, but for Montana, it's actually the second biggest town in terms of number of people. And even though there are relatively a lot of people here, more than half of the land in Missoula County is actually designated as forested or woodlands, meaning that despite having a heavy population of humans, there are tons of wild spaces and places where you're going to see something other than just concrete or human built structures. We are right here in the Rocky Mountain ecosystem. So besides humans, there's all kinds of other species you'll get to see here. A lot of neat mammals, both big and small, birds, all kinds of plants, amphibians and reptiles even. And we are so excited to get to show you all of those things here on Nature League, both on our field trips and in the studio. And now a word, not from our sponsors, but from the dictionary. Years of studying Latin in high school and a highly curious personality has made me into someone who loves words. Whenever I come across a term I'm unfamiliar with, I try breaking it down first and looking at its pieces. You'd be surprised by the fascinating stories that words begin to tell once you see their roots. Once a month on Nature League, we'll look at the etymology, or origin and history, of words related to nature. To start us off, I'll start with a personal favorite, the word ecology. Yes, you probably already know this word, and you probably already know that the ending ology means the study of, but what I find interesting about the word ecology is the first part. The word eco derives from the Greek word oikos, which actually means house. So while a formal definition of ecology might be the study of living and non-living things sharing an environment, ecology literally means the study of the house. Isn't that kind of beautiful? I mean, living and non-living things is true in denotation, but the word house has a totally different connotation or feeling, and it's one that I love. To me, the word origin recognizes that when we study living and non-living things, we're actually studying a home, and in the case of certain systems, our home. And this is a fundamentally different thing philosophically. It's asking us to be a part of the thing instead of just studying it, and that is pretty sweet. For other field trips here on Nature League, we're gonna go to all kinds of places that are right nearby here in Missoula. So we have the university, University of Montana right nearby with amazing scientists and really cool different labs and natural experiments all over the place. We also have Glacier National Park just to the north of us, which is awesome and I can't wait to take you guys there. We've also got the National Bison Range on the way up and Flathead Lake, which is totally beautiful. It's one of my favorite places. So with all of this, I think we have some serious fun ahead. Even when it's cold out, the beauty of Montana makes it worth calling this place home. The next life theme topic we tackled was in a format called Denatured, where I broke down a popular peer-reviewed journal article on the metabolisms of early life forms. We're going to look at an article published at the start of 2018 in the prestigious journal Nature Communications. The title of the paper is Linked Cycles of Oxidative Decarboxylation of Glyoxalate as Protometabolic Analogues of the Citric Acid Cycle. So yeah, remember when I mentioned jargon? Perfect example. Don't be daunted by the title. This study is actually really cool and is centered around investigating the beginnings of life on Earth. First, some background information. Aerobic organisms are ones that require oxygen to grow and develop, and all aerobic organisms on Earth release and use cellular energy by relying on something called the citric acid cycle. This cycle is also called the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle, but for this, we'll stick to the citric acid cycle. So, we know most life on Earth requires oxygen, and life that requires oxygen uses the citric acid cycle to release and use energy. Fair enough. But what does this have to do with the origins of life on Earth? The thing is, we're 
still trying to figure out what the first metabolic or energy cycles on Earth looked like. Keep in mind that this is an Earth before life as we know it, so a lot of this field of research tries to figure out what these old school pieces and cycles were. It's crazy to think about how life actually started. I mean, was there something metabolic before actual metabolisms existed? How could these cycles operate without things like enzymes and DNA? Those players weren't even there yet. Currently, most life on Earth uses the citric acid cycle. So this cycle and its reverse are currently the most investigated modern metabolic cycles when it comes to figuring out early life. Most studies have tried to use the citric acid cycle as a template for reactions on a prebiotic, or before life, Earth. Basically, they've assumed that this early Earth citric acid cycle would use the same molecular ingredients as the current one. However, these studies have yet to yield sustainable cycles, and the authors of the new study believe this is because those ingredients simply didn't exist yet on early Earth. In this new study, the researchers went in the opposite direction. Instead of trying to replicate modern biochemistry using the citric acid cycle, they instead used a bottom-up approach and started with several very simple abiotic, or non-living, molecules. In other words, they kept the same end goal of a functioning cycle, but asked themselves which ingredients present on early Earth would get them there. And now the exciting part. What did they find? Overall, the study found two linked abiotic cycles that not only produce carbon dioxide, but that generate stepping stone molecules that appear in the modern citric acid cycle. These intermediate molecules can even serve as a source of amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein. Voila! life. What's more, the cycles proceeded at mild temperatures and pH, meaning that there weren't any crazy artificial conditions being forced in the lab. In summary, the scientists found potential non-living starter cycles that may have paved the way for the citric acid cycle, and hence, most life on Earth. See? I told you it was cooler than what the title hinted at. Whenever I see a new edition of a scientific journal come out, I always like to question why the one cover article was chosen over all of the other submissions. Is it groundbreaking? Maybe it's relevant? something cultural? It's fun to think of the potential significance. The same goes for articles published in highly prestigious journals, much like Nature Communications, the journal where this article ended up. So here are my thoughts on why this made the cut for one of the top journals in the natural sciences. First off, originality. Not just in the way they approached the subject, but in the results they found. For example, while other studies haven't been able to sustain a reaction that keeps cycling, this team found abiotic cycles that have sustained turnover. And there's nothing like being first when it comes to getting published. While this study does exhibit some excellent creativity and novel results, I think there's something else going on in regards to its popularity and prowess. And that, I believe, is the general subject matter. We're obsessed with knowing where we came from. And by we, I mean almost everyone, including scientific journal editors and publishers. So when a study like this comes along to propose a possible route from non-living to living things on Earth, well, it's easy to want that in your journal. You've probably heard that the devil's in the details, but in scientific articles, he's definitely in the methods section. Whenever I read papers in high-profile journals, I like to look out for potential pitfalls in the methodology and conclusions. Articles with promising information that might relate to the origins of life on Earth are really sexy to journal editors, but with excitement comes occasional overlooking of issues. In this last section, I'd like to offer some balanced criticism of the study. Overall, this kind of study doesn't lend itself to being easily biased or misinterpreting results. Either you got a sustained cycle with turnover or you didn't, and it's easy to document document the exact processes along the way without bias. Like, we added 15 milligrams of this one chemical, and it didn't have to do with what we expected or wanted to see. So at least in this aspect, the study is well done. While there's very little bias in this study, there are some definite question marks surrounding the applicability. After all, we're talking about prebiotic Earth. Like, billions of years ago, and with billions of years comes a lot of uncertainty. Yes, the team was able to produce amino acids from starting molecules that we have evidence of existing on early Earth. But things like temperature and pH? Well, we just can't really be sure about what environment was like on early Earth. Plus, just because the team found cycles that could be precursors to the citric acid cycle doesn't mean that these two cycles were absolutely the things that became what we know today. The results are just one possibility of pre-life energy cycles that could have led to living energy cycles. Luckily, the authors point this out themselves, saying that similarities between the proto-metabolic cycles and the evolved biochemical pathways do not imply that there must be a historical link between them. In other words, they caution that just because their results are similar to today's citric acid cycle, it doesn't mean the cycles they found became the citric acid cycle over time. There's simply no way to know at this stage, and responsibly so, the authors state this alongside their exciting results. 
To round out the topic of life on Earth, I needed some help from a friend. In the very first installment of From A to B, the internet segment you didn't know you needed, my friend Adrian asked me about the possibility of life evolving without oxygen. I am very excited because right now we are about to do the first time our fourth segment for every month, which is called From A to B. Now, I am the B, which means we needed an A, and this is my good friend, Adrian Adams, and let's just say he has an interesting relationship with life on Earth, in that it both fascinates and terrifies him. You have not studied anything about zoology or biology, right? No, I haven't really done anything. Not unless I get like a wild hair up my butt. I'm like, I want to know how big a platypus egg is. It's like one and a half inches in diameter, bro. And that's where this idea came from, because Adrian likes to text me completely absurd things about animals that I used to just answer while shaking my head, but we said, you know what, it would actually be more fun if we just recorded this and shared it with all of you. And so the fourth week of every month, we are gonna do a segment where Adrian poses me a question, and I will do my best to answer it, and we can all learn a little bit, definitely laugh a lot, and maybe make fun of Adrian the tiniest bit as we go. What do you think? Yeah, all right, fine. As you all know, if you've been watching this month, the theme is life on Earth. So we wanted to start really broadly and just say, what does it mean to be alive on this planet? We did a field trip kind of talking about where we're filming. That was my background. We did a dig into some scientific literature about um, new forms of life and energy cycles. And we also talked a little bit about the characteristics of life. So I would like to know, what do you have for me today regarding life on Earth? Okay, so you've seen Zoolander, right? Mm -hmm. The commercial where it's like, water is the essence of beauty. What? Well, okay, so if water is, well, not beauty, but life, could there be life that doesn't need oxygen to live? Could we find life on another planet? You know, when we look for like um, Earth-like planets or planets that can house life, it's like we're looking for an oxygen, like a, an atmosphere kind of like ours, and we're looking for water. But there's got to be some kind of life out there that doesn't need what we need in order to survive, right? So there could just be like a giant ball of methane out there with some fish swimming around in the methane, right? Yeah, I think methane's a gas, so oh. swimming around in methane is... Probably problem number one. Flying fish. I'm sure we could get methane into other forms. But here's the thing. I might be about to blow your mind because there are actually a lot of life forms on Earth right now, not prehistoric, but right now that don't need oxygen at all. In fact, they even uh, will die in its presence. So let's hit a few things first. You're right that we generally think about oxygen as this big time power force for life, but that's because it's only one type of kind of energy mover and shaker. So when we think about metabolism, which is like add up all the building and breaking down of things in a system, oxygen plays a major role with that because it's mm -hmm. highly reactive. It, I mean, it wreaks havoc. It can be toxic in certain amounts, right? For example, like scuba divers, oxygen toxicity is one of the things that you have to watch out for and you do mixtures of, of gases. Aqua toxicity? Oxygen toxicity. Oxygen toxicity. Yes. So there are, creatures that live on earth that we call obligate anaerobes so two words we'll break them down obligate think like an obligation that means you something you Has have to, to have. have exactly okay. right anaerobe so an meaning like without and then aerobe meaning if you think air, air so oxygen so an anaerobe is an organism that does not use oxygen for what for metabolism again it's all about the role that oxygen plays in the creation of energy molecules basically mm -hmm. it is really good at oxidation and reduction reactions. It's a really good player when it comes down to what electrons are able to do when things are binding, when they're swapping back and forth. So this is what it does. There are creatures that have figured out how to do it without oxygen. Because think about how many elements there are, right? Water bears. Not an element. Sorry, <laughs> it took me a second to remember what they were called. Right, the little, the little, the little bips that float around in space that can survive in a vacuum. Nailed it. So that's probably an. You're talking tardigrade, right? What? A tardigrade, a water bear. Yeah, a water bear. That's what I said. What did you say? Tardigrade. Well, which is it? I'm pretty sure that's its name, and then that's like a cutesy water bear. Potato. Water bear. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a better question because there are actually quite a few things that can create energy 
totally in the presence of, without the presence of oxygen, mm -hmm. and in fact will die if in its right if mm -hmm. in its presence because mm -hmm. it winds up being toxic. They're, they are mostly unicellular. Do we know any uh, any multi-celled things that uh, don't like oxygen? Yes, and that's what's so cool. Oh, is. No, it's so cool. You shouldn't sound dejected. You should be like, that's exciting, Brit. Oh! <laughs> that is much better. Thank you. <laughs> so, it wasn't until recently that we actually figured out there's a multicellular organism that 100% lives without oxygen. Because it's one thing to be like, it survived for 30 seconds without oxygen. And then... I can do that. You sure can. And I'm proud of you. <laughs> but actually lives exclusively anaerobically, and they are called Lorisifera, and they are tiny, so very small, but they are multicellular, and they are within the animal kingdom. And so that was actually a big hmm. deal, because we were like, you know what? Whoa, right? <gasps> Just like that. So where do you think those live? In the ocean, because that seems to be where all really basic life exists. Next to a vent, one of those spires that just... It's like just, playing charades. <laughs> it lives in the ocean next to a vent where all the hot water comes out. I don't know, I don't know if they're specifically near, so you're thinking about hydro, like hydro Hydro vent, vents. Where those are anoxic, so without oxygen environments, mm -hmm. and we actually find a lot of anaerobic organisms Wait, near there. Wait, what? What? I'm There's saying, oxygen there. There's got to be oxygen so there, because like crabs live there. Mm, so in those sulfuric vents, yeah. though, like actually oh, like in, in those, those, right, where uh, we find certain bacteria. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. So the Lorisifera, yes, they're in the ocean. So if you want to really think back, though, our Earth did not always have oxygen. In fact. Yes. When researchers have been looking into this, they basically look at two different pieces in time. There's the oxygenation event where we got a lot of atmospheric oxygen, and there's also the deep ocean oxygenation event. So basically, that would have come after we got it in the atmosphere because sure. it needed to dissolve and then go down to the bottom. And so, in order to have something that is doing just fine without oxygen, that tells us that in its evolutionary history, it most likely was around in deep ocean, right? Uh -huh. Before oxygen even got there. And okay. hasn't had a reason to need to change that. Well well then why aren't we why aren't we just like convinced looking at any other kind of uh, oceanic environment in our own solar system? Why can't we just be like, "Oh hey, Neptune, is there is there water on Neptune? I can't remember." I'm getting thrown off. No, it's a gas giant. But can the is the gas like is it cuz the there's gas on Titan, but the gravity is so strong it's like pudding. I remember that from elementary school. So there's no other water in our solar system besides on Earth? There's an in frozen form, so... Yeah, so why couldn't there be... Well, do we know it's frozen all the way through? How do we know that the heat of the planet isn't warming up part of it? Are you telling... There can't be ice from the top all the way down to the bottom. There's not. You'll see a thousand years from now when these have been in the, all of these episodes have been put in the Library of Congress, they'll be like, hey, I knew it. Somebody called it. And then they'll just look at everything I say from here on out and I'll be the new Nostradamus for the 3,000th uh, century. There's a difference between some liquid water and an ocean. So it's not totally fair to be like, let's look at all the other oceans in our solar system and see if we find it. It's like, do we ever find, that's a lot. That's yeah. a tall build to ask for an ocean. Okay, yeah, but do, do we ever find uh, bacteria frozen in our glaciers, up uh, our, our polar ice caps? Do we ever find microscopic life yeah. in the ice? Yeah. Well, then who's to say that we aren't gonna find microscopic ice on the ice? It's just on Mars. It's no right there. One. I don't think that life is as rare as we think it is. Perhaps life is evolving right now, right outside of our own solar system, in a totally different environment than what we would predict just because life on Earth has evolved this way. So, th so our, our thinking has become modular. Oxygen, water, sunlight, warmth. I would say that it is highly likely because on just our one planet, we see organisms use everything from sulfur to oxygen to light, right, to make energy. So I say if we have that much variety here, 
absolutely there's other ways to do it, right? We see it in the incredible amount of biodiversity we have here in terms of how things use and cycle energy, right? Yeah. So I venture to say yes. After I said it, I said it first, literally said it first. <laughs> Our first month was all about life, and we had a ton of fun researching, creating, and filming the content you've seen in this compilation. Thanks so much for watching, and if you'd like to keep going on Life on Earth adventures with us here on Nature League, make sure to go to youtube.com slash Nature League, subscribe, and share.